thanks. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. They roused me out of my retired stupor to be here. Uh, first, and nothing I'm saying represents the NSF today because I'm gone from there. Um, there, you may know that there are two homes for undergraduate chemistry education at the National Science Foundation. One is in the education directorate in the Division of Undergraduate Education, which actually involves all of the STEM disciplines. And that was where I served for 20 years until a year ago. And education is the main focus there. Historically, there were a number of different education programs. The other place where undergrad education is funded is in MPS, in the chemistry division. That's where research is a major focus, and that's where many of you get your research grants. They also have been responsible for the REU program, which puts undergraduates into research labs. Um, education shows up in their proposals as a broader impact, and occasionally they've had other, um, usually short-lived education programs. Um, today, you've all seen that the workshop focus is supposed to be on drivers, barriers, and new results, but I wanted to make sure that people were aware that there's just a boatload of existing results um, on successful undergrad chem education interventions on content, pedagogy, laboratory efforts, all of the things that Dr. Gates mentioned this morning about active learning strategies. Most of these have been perfected for the chemistry community. And also there's a very large chemistry education research or a very active, maybe not as large as they want to be, but a very active group of chemistry education research people, and they work on issues of student learning of chemistry. And if you're not familiar with these two areas, there are a lot of ways to access what's going on in chemistry. One is to look through the Journal of Chemical Education. Another is to look at the Division of Chem Ed Programs at both the fall and spring national ACS meetings. So you can go online, look back, see what kinds of symposia have been um, undertaken in the last 20 years. There are also two Gordon Research Conferences that focus on education. One is Chemistry Education Research and Practice. And this was initiated in 1994 by Angie Stacy, who will be speaking this afternoon, and Art Ellis. And that has continued in odd years. There's also a broader conference on visualizations in, in science and education, which also had a different name earlier. It started in 1998, covers all science disciplines, but since it's visualization, there's a heavy emphasis on chemistry. So you can go to the GRC site, look back through programs over the last 20 years and find out a lot of what's been going on. And what you already know from this morning, there are hundreds of reports from policy groups, professional organizations, and others um, most of these include all of STEM, but they will also let you know what's been going on sometimes. Other times they contain recommendations for what should be done in undergrad chemistry education. There's also a new book that Tom Holm is one of the editors of. He'll be speaking this afternoon. That's probably not on the book. But it's covering trajectories of chemistry education. And there's, I think, about 14 chapters in there. It's being published by the ACS Books. It's in press now. And this looks over pretty much the last 20 years of undergraduate chemistry education and what are some of the innovations that have come along and how have they developed. Again, a big emphasis on active learning strategies as opposed to content issues. Now, today I'm going to hit a number of different topics. And one of them is on some of the blurred, both conversations that happen about education, but also when people are talking about making policy changes at all. And sometimes these conversations are very garbled. And one, sometimes it's because educational levels get blurred. One person is talking about grade school, middle school, high school. Someone else is talking about two-year schools. Someone else, four-year schools. You can be talking about graduate, master's, or doctoral education, or postdoc education. And it's fine if people are clear what they're talking about, but a lot of times they're not. Um, another thing that causes trouble in conversations is blurring various undergraduate groups of students. So for instance, are you talking about junior and senior level chemistry majors? That's a very, very narrow group 
and subset of all students who run through chemistry departments taking courses? Or are people talking about first and second year students who might become chem majors? Are people talking about students in two year schools and associate degree students? Are people talking about other science majors who are taking chem courses? Or what about the non-science majors who either are in chem courses as non-science majors or get driven to be non-science majors? And a lot of times people are implicitly talking about the best and brightest students only in a chem curriculum without being explicit that they're only talking about a small subset. So what about, are people talking about the other students, including students who have perhaps been poorly served in their earlier chem courses, either in college or high school, and where you might really want to do something about the education. And the final kind of way that conversations get very blurred and reports get written in strange ways is what are you trying to do if you're talking about undergrad education? Are you really talking about generating chem majors who will go to grad school? Or are you talking about bachelor or two-year level majors who are going to have industrial jobs? Or are you talking about producing K through 12 teachers? Or what about the pre-health majors? We just heard about worrying about pre-med students, but there's also physical therapy, a bunch of other pre-health majors. Um, or are you, are you thinking about trying to increase the number of chemistry or other STEM graduates with associate or bachelor's degrees? Or is someone worried about developing citizens, um, non-science majors, but people who are appropriately based for the rest of their lives in STEM or chemistry? And what about is an issue expanding the diversity of students that are majoring in science by both gender, ethnicity, um, socioeconomic background? And so again, being clear about which of these people are talking about helps a lot in clarifying the discussion. Okay, here's a slide of a couple of things that are unique when people are dealing with undergrad chem reform. And one is that chemistry is pretty much blessed at most colleges and universities by having full first and second year classes, right? And it's because of all these other majors that are required to go through the programs. The other things that happen at many institutions, students are repeating these courses. So 10, 20 percent of the class may be the same students that were there last year. But it keeps the enrollments full, it keeps the classrooms full, and it makes it not be a driver for reform if you're overloaded with students. And another thing that the chem profession is actually probably very good at in terms of ethics and morality is worrying about whenever chemists are unemployed. You start hearing that we're producing too many PhDs or too many bachelors in chemistry, and you see CNE news articles, talks at ACS meetings. But again, the concern is sometimes that diverts people from thinking about the fact that there's still a lot that might need to be done in undergrad chemistry. So if we're talking about developing and implementing reforms, and for the most part here, I'm thinking about a lot of the kinds of pedagogical issues, the active learning strategies that Dr. Gates um, listed this morning. So the kinds of efforts where you really have to change how you're teaching so that the students will learn more and more students will be more successful. And in trying to do these kinds of reforms, the process is really very long, it's very complex, it needs actually to be ongoing, and often the results along the way are, are surprising so that you have to reformulate what, what you're doing. But always these reforms are really dependent on having very specific committed faculty members who are really taking the lead on doing this. In other words, committee recommendations, reports, don't do anything for actually implementing reforms. And if there's going to be a major kind of change in how a course is taught, you have to assume that it will take a decade or more for that reform to hit a national level. Um, the chemistry community was kind of blessed by having the chemistry initiative that started at NSF in the mid-90s and with a large slug of money and there were five major projects and an additional 10 to 15 million dollars went into things that grew out of that initiative. But what happened is a number of new ways of teaching became widely in 
um, instituted across the country. And also, this generated a huge cadre of faculty who were familiar with undergraduate education in chemistry and thinking about it. And it also drove the development of a much larger chemistry education research field. So some of the questions that come out of when you're trying to do a reform is why does a project not persist at a developer's institution? And a really good reason is that the intervention didn't work or it may not have worked well enough to be worth the effort. But a lot of times the effort starts with one faculty member or a few and what can happen if it devolves down to one member is obviously if the faculty member loses interest, changes teaching assignment, leaves the institution, the project stops. So what you want to do on these slides is be thinking about, so what would you do so this didn't happen? That's really what these are meant to do. Also, if the implementation involves technology, you all know the platforms change, and a lot of times developers just get tired of spending their time adapting to a new platform. Also, there's always these institutional and departmental changes, priorities change, or and sometimes because of a new chair or a dean or provost. And sometimes really severe budget constraints will make an institution have to rethink who and what it's teaching and that may um, make some of these projects not work. But another condition that often happens is there's a project that's very successful at one or a few institutions, but it doesn't travel. And why is that? And one obvious reason could be that the topic of the, the um, intervention is not of interest or relevance or need elsewhere. But many times the original developers weren't thinking or didn't care about having the project travel. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but it means if the developers did not bring in faculty from other institutions initially, they're going to end up with a project that's very idiosyncratic to the faculty at the home institution and it won't travel. Another reason that things often don't travel, though, is that many projects that are implemented are never perfected sufficiently to travel or even to keep going at the home institution because typically you have to develop materials, develop a pedagogy, implement it, and then evaluate to find out, eh, not working so well, we should improve this. You have to revise, evaluate again, revise, evaluate. And, you know, the goal is really to have something be very easy to keep using and yet very effective. And that takes a lot of revision. The other reason that projects and implementations don't travel is that it takes really a multi-year dissemination effort that usually needs a combination of people speaking at professional meetings, but also workshops where new adapters can come. And also you need people available so that when someone's trying to adapt, they have someone to consult. And again, the original developers may not be interested in doing this, or they may be interested but not have enough personnel in their group um, to be able to maintain this elaborate dis dissemination effort. Or, again, this kind of dissemination is not in the self-interest of any particular institution, and so often there's, you need outside funding to get that done. Many cross-departmental projects at one institution, for instance, something like trying to increase the number of STEM two-year or four-year graduates, or trying to um, implement or expand the program where you're going to be developing K-12 teachers, um, then these kinds of projects have to fit the institutional culture or mission if they're going to keep going. They still need specific faculty leaders. Again, it doesn't do any good if the dean says do it and nobody's committed. Um, and then they also will need a lot of, they'll need faculty time or people allowed to spend their faculty time on the project, um, no destructive interference at the institution, and also they'll need to be able to use the facilities, um, the labs and so forth to teach. And they also will need active institutional support. So for those of you that are chairs and deans, um, you know that you have to back these kinds of efforts. Often registrars have to get involved to keep track of things. The, um, and then eventually they're going to probably need financial support for a while after the initial funding is over in order to get the thing really underway. And so you can imagine there's many ways to cause these larger cross-departmental projects to end. 
um, changing priorities, or often you get new chairs, deans, or provosts, and they're not going to be able to make their name on this existing intervention, and so it disappears. Now, these are two just miscellaneous comments, but one is when thinking about trying to make changes at the undergraduate level, um, lots of times agencies or private foundations, industry, will provide scholarships or internships or direct support to students. And one of the things to always remember is that direct support, financial support to students, the benefit travels with the student. You've trained a student, allowed them to become educated. When they leave, they take that with them, but there will be essentially no trace left at the institution. And that's why things like programs that are purely scholarships are great when the funding's there, but they don't lead to any institutional change in general. Another area that's been mentioned a number of times today are research opportunities for undergrads, and NSF has a big REU program, but again, many other agencies and foundations support undergrad research, and there are huge benefits to undergrad research. But again, the benefits as far as undergrads are concerned travel and disappear when the student is gone. I mean, it doesn't disappear from the student, disappears from the school. But one of the things also that's important to think about here is many of these um, opportunities go to the best and brightest upper level students. And if that's the intent, that's great. But it also means that it's doing nothing to expand the pool of majors. And it also, um, the third bullet here, that there's very little information on whether research opportunities are highly effective if you were to give a research opportunity to a student who's less prepared, not quote the cliched best and brightest, but and less committed, will this make a change in what the student does or not and how they view themselves? And likewise, lower level freshmen, sophomores, who are not already the most committed students to a STEM degree, um, will this have an effect or not? And those are things worth knowing. But anyway, so whenever there's a research opportunity for undergrads, it's important to think about what are you trying to achieve with this. Okay, now reform efforts, everyone's always saying, have to evaluate, have to evaluate, have to evaluate. And evaluation, as people who have tried this know, is a really tricky topic. And one reason is granting agencies usually require an evaluation of some undergraduate chem interventions say, but the timeline is usually way too early in the project's life. If you have a three or four year grant, by the time you develop or adapt what you want to try and you implement it, if you then do the evaluation, you haven't really had time to play out the intervention over a number of trials. And so you can get some information, but it's not what you really want ultimately. But if a project is doing an evaluation for its own purposes at its institution, that's great. And that's really, those evaluations are usually very worthwhile if they're done appropriately. Agencies also, and NSF does this all the time, um, require evaluations of programs. But most educational programs at NSF don't last long. Um, a program that exists for a decade is, that's about the lifespan of most of the educational programs. So the program ramps up, gives out some grants, the principal investigators get together, begin to figure out how would be the best way to do whatever the goal is. The program directors are learning what to do. You go along for a couple more years and the program is stopped. And so now when there's an evaluation of the program, it may find out really important things about the program, but the problem is there's no program anymore, and so the evaluation tends to sit unused, many aspects of it. And the other problem is that agencies, and even universities do this, um, their interests have moved on. And so the evaluation of program X, that's now gone anyway, may not answer the new questions about what the new goals are. So those are another reasons that I think evaluations get an unduly bad rep because they're being asked to account for something that's not what they were trying to do. And the other thing is that you have to always know that all evaluations are always challenged. And when evaluating a project, you have to decide what are you interested in, what are you trying to find out. 
and 50 other people will tell you you should have been trying to find out something else. You have to ignore it. Okay, now over my 20 years at NSF, over and over and over, there were certain things that were showing up as missed opportunities in the chemistry field. And this is for the American Chemical Society. We can proceed to offend everyone at ACS. But ACS, as we all know, has great national meetings. But the division of Chem Ed is, has a, usually a very large set of programming. And as a consequence, it's almost always at a site separate from the rest of the ACS meeting. It means that if you are a faculty member and you're interested in undergrad chemistry education, but it's your secondary concern, there's virtually no way that you're going to hop 18 blocks to see what's going on in a few talks. So that's always been a problem. I don't know the solution. I just, I just get to say the problems. And likewise, many of the research divisions do not have education presentations. And actually, sometimes they do, and the audience goes out for coffee, and I'm not sure what you do about that either. But it means that there's not really much cross-fertilization between what's going on in undergraduate education, which is probably of interest, even if not the prime concern, to most of the people at an ACS meeting. Also, most ACS journals do not include education papers. That again means there's no cross-fertilization. If your interest is in research topic X, you're not going to stumble across a relevant education paper when reading the journal. Also, most of the new presidents of ACS they typically have a focus on education, but often they could be better informed. So that while their year is playing out and they're organizing symposia or having workshops, that there was a better foundation laid. And that probably is up to, a, the last I knew, ACS did not offer education training for new presidents. And CPT, and we heard today what CPT does, and they do exactly what they're charged to do, and they do it incredibly well. But it's worrying about chemistry content, and they're supposed to be worrying about chemistry majors. And that leaves ACS with no real spearhead for pedagogical changes, active learning, how students learn, how chemistry courses should be changed so that students actually do learn better and even faster. And also it leaves the ACS with no suggestions or guidelines at all for all of those students in undergrad, freshman, and sophomore chemistry, um, whether they're other science majors or not science majors at all. No, there's no focus for thinking about those issues. And the other problem is if you were a chemist and you wanted to learn what was going on in undergrad science, chemistry education, a reasonable thing to do would be to go to the ACS website. But the ACS website in undergrad education points only to the ACS own work. And you could contrast that if you go to the American Physical Society, they will point to the major, most promising undergraduate efforts across all of physics, not just being funded by ATS. Other opportunities are chemistry is a huge fraction of the Gordon Research Conferences. And that's another place where people might be able to put a relevant education talk into a Gordon Research Conference on some topic. And again, there would be a captive audience sitting there. And likewise, other professional conferences um, might start including a relevant, you know, an education talk or symposium. PitCon started doing this in the mid-1990s, and they have very active now, primarily focusing on analytical chemistry, undergrad chemistry education information.